host of Kennedy on Fox Business, Kennedy herself, former department or deputy spokesperson for the State Department, Marie Harf, and joining us today on the couch, editor in chief of the Daily Caller News Foundation, Chris Bedford. He is outnumbered. And he is engaged. <laughs> Happy One New Year. I mean, this is just hours. It's it's like new car smell. I can't wait. Hours old. Katie Congratulations. Freitas. And Thank she you. she is beautiful. She is smart, and I love having her as a guest on my show. You Thank know, you. Yeah. So it's terrific. I agree. Welcome, Chris. <laughs> All right. Okay. The tell-all book about the Trump White House released early, after the president's attorney tried to block publication. President Trump tweeted this, I authorized zero access to the White House, actually turned him away many times, for the author of phony book, I never spoke to him for the book, full of lies, misrepresentations, and sources that don't exist. Look at this guy's past and watch what happens to him and sloppy Steve, <laughs> wolf hitting back with this. I absolutely spoke to the president, whether he realized it was an interview or not. Um, I, I don't know, but it certainly was not off the record. My credibility is being questioned by a man who has less credibility than perhaps anyone who has ever walked on earth at this point. You stand by everything in the book, nothing made up. Absolutely everything in the book. White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders says Wolf is simply not telling the truth. He never interviewed the president about the book. He repeatedly begged to speak with the president and was denied access. And he makes it sound uh, like he was sitting outside the Oval Office every single day, which is just not the case. This individual, Michael Wolff, has a long history of not being... Uh, a very credible when it comes to sourcing, when it comes to putting books together. Wolf goes on to say he spoke to a lot of people who had access to the president. Here's more from that interview. According to your reporting, everyone around the president, senior advisors, family members, every single one of them questions his intelligence and fitness for office. Let me, let me put a, put a, a marker in the, in the sand here. 100 percent of people around him. Jared Kushner, his son-in-law, Ivanka Trump, question his fitness for office? Certainly Jared and Ivanka in, in their current situation, which is a... Um, um, in a deep legal quagmire are putting everything on the president. Not us, it's him. Wolf says out of all the people he spoke with, one thing they told him was the president acts like a child. Those are his words. He was asked for more detail. You said that these senior people insult his intelligence. What are the kinds of things people would say? They say he's um, a, a moron, an idiot. Um, actually, there's a competition to sort of get to the bottom line here of who this man is. Let's remember, this man does not read, does not listen. So uh, he, he, he's, he's, like a, um, he's like a pinball, just, just, just shooting off the side. Speaking of shooting, Sarah Sanders was shooting down all those claims making this point. It's absolutely outrageous to, to make these types of accusations, uh, and it's simply uh, untrue, and it's sad that people are going uh, and making these desperate attempts to attack the president. What I think is really mentally unstable is people that don't see the positive impact that this president is having on the country. Sloppy Steve. I believe that they're talking about Steve Bannon there. Uh, Chris, what are your thoughts about where the White House is now? Because they pressed legally, and then the book came out. Uh, early. Well, yeah. Well, there's no legal mechanism that even exists to stop a book from publishing. The Supreme Court has crushed prior restraint. They say that you can't do that. That's an attack on the First Amendment. So that was kind of a bluff move. I'm not sure where the White House was going with that. Mm -hmm. Maybe it might be a little bit smarter to check the facts with Wolf. Now, Wolf's a great writer, an interesting guy, but he also. His own editor said one of his greatest gifts, a past editor, said one of his greatest gifts is creating the illusion that he has got uh, uh, always there, intimate access. The New York Times says he gets it wrong. Washington Post says that he's got a very imaginative storytelling ability. The White House has much better luck doing that, and trying to crush this with prior restraint, which there's no way to do that, is not, is, is really good for his sales. You know, he's calling himself a journalist, and you were pointing out right before the show that the language that's being used, I was sensitive to the fact that if the president was not sure that this was for a book, 
Did Michael Wolff do his job and make it clear? Well, there's, that's not journalism. There's some interesting use of wording that stands out as you listen to more and more. Sarah Sanders saying he was never interviewed for the book. He never said anything to this author for the book. And the president in his own statement said, I was never interviewed for the book. It's not that I didn't say these things to Wolf, mm -hmm. right? So there's some specifics in the wording there. But I was talking to Ari Fleischer earlier this mm -hmm. morning, and he was very quick to point out, the American people, you know, we're leading with the story. It's headlines everywhere right now, and it's interesting, and it's salacious, mm -hmm. and people people are tuned in, they're listening, but it doesn't affect them when it comes to their pocketbook or their family or, you know, when it comes to the economy. And Ari Fleischer was saying that the Republicans right now, when they huddle at Camp David this weekend, they have got to get together, and they've got to figure out a way to change the conversation. Yeah. And yeah. this president's got to focus on where he's winning. Can they do that, I guess, is a big question. But but the point that I was getting at, Kennedy, just with the book's sake, is that if Michael Wolff went into the White House and didn't make it clear when he sat down with the the president of the United States that this was journalism, that, that he was interviewing him for publication or a book or whatever, that sounds like an ambush. That's no, this is, this is, this is a, a writer who had actually written uh, a piece about the president that the president liked and therefore granted him access. And Michael Wolf originally was going to write an article. And, you know, if, if a journalist is going to take the raw material that he or she has and, and turn it into a book, so you, you know, that, that, that potential is always there. Mm -hmm. I don't think the White House knew, and I think that's why Michael Wolf was given that kind of access, because these are people who are strangers to the political establishment, which is a blessing and a curse. And here, it's very dangerous for them because you have a lot of people who are not as media savvy as, you know, some slippery career politicians, and they don't know when to tell a journalist off a record, but that's on them. Mm -hmm. That is that is on every single person in that White House. If they're disclosing something that they don't want to be published, they have to tell the journalist off the record. You have to say right. that. The president knows that now, as we know from the New York Times impromptu interview that he just sat down for. He constantly told the writer off the record, and that's why they, they published parts of the transcript that they said were, were edited. So you have to know, if you're talking to someone like this, you don't know where the journalist or the writer is going to go with the you story, know, therefore the you have to be very careful about what you say and what you hold back. One of the things that Katie Pavlich said as she sat on that very seat yesterday was that covering the president, sometimes it's a little confusing because they'll be told on and off the record, back and forth, or at the end of something the that White off the, right, right, right. So she said you've really got to be paying attention. That's not what this was though. This was access, and Maria, I'm going to ask you to lean in on your nonpartisan, if mm -hmm. you can, experience, and just talk to me about how these kinds of things happen. How do they play out, you know, at those higher levels, the, the request to get in, the right. interview process. Well, and and it is a staffing issue, right? And yes, some of them are outsiders, but think about when Wolf started getting access. Sean Spicer was still there. Reince Priebus was still there. These are people who have dealt with reporters for decades, and they should know that, you know, when a reporter comes to you or an author comes to you and asks for access to any principal, whether it's the president, the secretary of state, asked to come in and interview people, you have to assume that everything is on the record, unless you make explicitly clear that it's not. And I know that sounds sort of and like... you also have to assume they don't have rosy intentions. Exactly, right? These aren't people... This isn't a charity, right? These aren't people... It's not the Clinton Foundation. It's, oh, good. That Ooh, was good. That's like a topic that. for that later good. in the show. Um, but you have to assume these people are not here to help you. And you have to always protect your boss. You have to protect the institution where you work. And they did not do that in this Those case. Those are a lot of requirements. And from what we've been told from this White House, 95% of the time that whoever let him in or gave him access to the White House, he was with Steve Bannon. So who thought that was a good idea? And in addition to letting him into that White House that many times to begin with. And due diligence was skipped, not just by the White House here, but by a lot of editors who have been reprinting this stuff without checking. If any one of my reporters came to me and said, Steve Bannon said this, this person said this, the president said that, I'd say, I need your notes, I need your sources. I need Maybe your he gave them to his editors. Maybe. So the editors have been reprinting he the says, He says he's, he's got, has, got recordings. Well, his editors, though, he says he has At recordings. Right, he says he has recordings, he says he has notes. Steve Bannon has not said he didn't say any of these but things. You know, yeah, don't you think Bannon would have vociferously yes. denied a lot oh, of I these statements that have put him in? Yeah, absolutely. Well, he hasn't refuted them. Yeah. The leaks right. in the White House have basically stopped since he and Ryan Spreebus so, left. I, I just want to take it down to the basic level, because when something like this happens, I, I think beyond the book, I think of access to the most powerful man and our constellation, mm -hmm. and arguably around the world. Th that's kind of disturbing. Yes. And it wouldn't matter who it was or what their intentions. Maybe, maybe it was the most, you know, uh, conciliatory or sweet writer in the world. 
but they had access. And so I'm wondering, did staff break rules? What happened here? This is America's president. I, I think what it shows is, particularly at the beginning, this was an administration in chaos. I mean, we saw that. I don't think they expected to win. We saw how the hiring, you know, was it was. Well, very... now you're just getting stuff out of the book. So no, no, I, again, I'm not. It needs no, no, to be no, no. better. This is things that report, you know, people have reported, including in our network. That's part of the reason Ryan's previous was forced out and John Kelly was brought in. This was an administration that had a lot of different power centers. They operated differently than other administrations. And I think there were reporters like Michael Wolf getting access. Every, to every administration stumbles, I but I think Wolf realized that this was an ongoing gift. And, and on the fact that there were, there were yeah. so many people who were unguarded around him. Uh, in fact, he's quoted saying, I was waiting for that call. Yes. When yeah. he was not going to be allowed back in the White House. After he kept Kelly showing up and he, One he, he, he knew for. that it was chaotic and he knew that this would be something that would benefit his career as well. One thing is for sure, the book's been out for about three and a half hours now. And uh, earlier in the week, it was at 48,499 position on Amazon. Now it's at number one. Uh, and so we'll see what happens. Yeah. Okay, House investigators will now get to talk to key witnesses in their Russia investigation after a deal between the House Intelligence Chairman and the Justice Department. What lawmakers could learn from interviewing Peter Strzok, Lisa Page, and Brian Orr. Remember a little bias going on there? Plus, Hillary Clinton under the microscope once again on two fronts. Mm -hmm. What the Justice Department wants to know now and whether she'll ever be held accountable. Fresh new investigations. Stay close. Hillary Clinton now the focus of a new investigation on two fronts. The Daily Beast reporting uh, reports Attorney General Jeff Sessions is launching a new probe into her private server and its transmission of classified material. The announcement comes the same day a watchdog group announced a Freedom of Information request revealed 18 classified emails on Anthony Weiner's laptop sent by his wife and Clinton aide Huma Abedin. Former Clinton spokesman Brian Fallon saying of the new probe, quote, I think that even that is extremely dangerous and that the Justice Department should not be opening itself up to the perception that it is bending to political pressures from the White House. The department is supposed to operate independently of the White House. And even if this is just a perfunctory step that they're taking to try to appease the president, that in and of itself is an abuse of the DOJ authority. The president has repeatedly asked for a new investigation into Clinton's email practices. In the meantime, the Justice Department is also launching a probe into whether the Clinton Foundation was involved in any pay-to-play politics or other illegal activities while Clinton served as Secretary of State. White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders reacting to all of this this morning. I think there have been a lot of things that give us cause for concern, and I think it's a great thing that, that it's being looked at. Uh, and we'll have to wait and see what happens, but there's certainly been a lot of information out there that I think is all of us cause for concern, and I think it's important that they're finally taking a look at it, and, and we'll, see, we'll see what comes from it. Chris, I'll tell you where Marie Harf's going to come on this, because I talked to you about it last night. I know, night. I was going to say, we had this conversation and, already. <laughs> and some are going to say that this leads to the optics or the perception that the DOJ is bending to political pressures, like the president's been asking for this for quite some time, mm -hmm. and now it's happening. Is that the case here? Well, she was also investigated when, the pre when Obama was president of the United States, and she's being investigated again. There is a perception, more than just of politics, of actual potential criminal wrongdoing here. And, you know, I tell you, this, this Little Rock story is so frustrating because we were so close to breaking it, but we couldn't get that second source on the record. I'm glad it's out there anyways. Uh, you know, this pay-to-play thing, whether it's Uranium One, whether it's the Laureate Foundation, uh, Education Foundation, which is a lot of these companies are really closely mm -hmm. attached to the Clintons, have yeah. collapsed since she didn't win the presidency. Now, even if something that she did was otherwise meritous and otherwise okay to do in her job, mm -hmm. it's not okay to do that if you're accepting money in some other way. And that's not a defense against charges of bribery, and that could potentially come up. It's not just pay-to-play, too, right? This investigation is going to be looking into tax evasion. Yes, exactly. The foundation as well. And so uh, they're going 
trying to see if there was some sort of money laundering and uh, the taxes were not paid because the money was sent through the Clinton Foundation, which a lot of people have said was a one-stop shop for money laundering. And that's what it appears to be. And as you point out, you know, some of these companies have gone under. We don't hear a lot about the Clinton Foundation and its charitable. They shut down their international side. Yeah, exactly. And and what happened to the Clinton Global Initiative? You, yep. you just don't hear as much about it. And we've seen so many catastrophes where it seems like if you've got two people, an ex-president and a former Secretary of State, with all this time on their hands, they would be rolling up their sleeves like Jimmy Carter and, and putting their good foundation to work. We just don't see that. All we see is Hillary Clinton running around blaming a laundry list of people for, uh, you know, a for number what of happened. reasons. Yeah. What happened? But but as another, in, let her do as that. another investigation is opened, we ask, is anything going to ever come of this? Well, I think we have to follow the facts. And you said a lot of things that are accusations, but many of them don't have facts to back them up yet. I mean, we can talk about all of them, whether it's Uranium One or something else. But on the email situation... Did Bill Clinton get a half million dollars for one speech in Russia? On the email situation... Yes. Yep. Is, that oh, why this, facts? is that why the State <laughs> Department approved this? No. That's a fact, also. So let's be careful here. On the email well, let's talk about the, the curious timing, on the CNA, On the email situation, um, that has been investigated by the Department of Justice, and that investigation was closed, and they looked at new information, including from Huma Abedin and from Anthony Weiner. That was part of the investigation. It was still closed. So I'm happy for people to take another look at the investigation, but I agree this has every marking of a political Investigation. I should rephrase the question because when I was, is anything to come of this? Of course, things uh, things came of the original investigation. Right. I know that she exchanged classified information on a private server that she was not supposed to have. My question is, will anybody ever be held accountable of any findings? So, you well, know, DOJ Sam gave recommendations and they followed them. DOJ. They were the yeah. Republicans yeah. just don't <laughs> like them. Okay, James <laughs> Comey, who was arguably in the tank Worst for Hillary negligent. Clinton, said that Loretta Lynch was in the tank for Hillary Clinton. So they're the arguing who was deeper like in them. the tank. This is James Comey. Republicans and Democrats didn't like him. And, and the, but his his Federal Bureau of Investigation had several senior members with close ties to the Clintons or close uh, alliances. Yeah, and there's no, and, and, and the head so of the FBI is saying wanna, that Loretta Lynch was ahead, the head of the I, DOJ. I just want to point to the fact that when investigations break open like this, uh, while Democrats have been wildly excited about the fact that uh, Robert Mueller's investigation has gone wide and broad, it can happen like this for Hillary Clinton, too. So when you talk about tax evasion and tax issues, you talk about who was running the foundation at the time. I believe it was Chelsea. You've got somebody who's ready to start, reportedly, her potential political career. You've got a lot of things coming into play now that the Clintons might want to protect. And Attorney General... And, and so, you know, what we say in the South about the goose and the gander, you were going to say? Attorney General Jeff Sessions does not have any history of ever bending to politics or do things that are just convenient. Look at this marijuana uh, thing he really? just changed recently. <laughs> with the, it's obviously not in alignment with the president. He didn't do this immediately right after he became attorney general. He slow walked this over a year. He took a lot of heat from the but president. he's still doing it. And the president has repeatedly asked, not, called on not. him to. And this is this is such a terrible precedent. There is no new information. Why is this a terrible Because there's no the new information that has come forward that would hasten reopening these investigations. You don't know, that. You don't know everything. Well, we haven't that. seen any of it. Okay. So you let's follow the facts and well, not just make have assumptions. That part of it. Maybe they only leak the parts that are damaging to the political opposition. We'll say and it was a lot more than just the president we'll who want, wanted this. I mean, I've I've interviewed a lot of House and, and Senate Intel members who who said that this is the direction to go in. And they're all Republicans. This is political. Well, and I've had two on at one time from both parties, and political. what they talk about is if if there's anything there, let's get to the bottom of it okay, and move on. So you also wrong about feel that. it's political, right. then you have both sides that are saying the same thing. So yeah. maybe you need greater objective oversight. In a deal reached between the Justice Department and the House Intelligence Committee, I was just talking about them, <laughs> the committee chair, Devin Nunez, and House investigators will get complete access this week to all remaining documents in unredacted form which they were seeking as part of their Russia inquiry. That's according to a letter from Nunez to the Department, uh, to the Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein, obtained by Fox News. It summarizes the agreement which was reached this week and says FBI and Justice Department witnesses will be provided for interviews later this month. That includes FBI agent Peter Strzok and FBI lawyer Lisa Page. Remember them? They were caught exchanging those anti-Trump text messages, as well as Bruce Orr, the DOJ official whose wife happened to work for Fusion GPS the firm that was uh, looking at the anti-Trump dossier and helping put that together. 
or was demoted after concealing, uh, concealing meetings with people involved in that anti-Trump dossier, House Majority Whip. Steve Scalise says it's very important for investigators to talk to these people. You've seen an exposure of what I think is a lot of corruption and, and real concerns that have been raised about the special counsel. In fact, just the credibility of the special counsel is very much in question because, as you mentioned, so many of the people that, that Mueller brought in, uh, the people working on that, uh, were, were very anti-Trump in the campaign and still to this day. So I think just the impartiality of this investigation has been called into question, and I have some real serious concerns about it. Your thoughts, Chris? You know, this is not the, age, the uh, days of J. Edgar Hoover when the FBI just has a vice grip, answers only to itself. This is a good step in the right direction for the FBI to actually turn this, this information over to Congress. Congress has oversight. The FBI doesn't operate completely without, with impunity. And we've been seeing these really self-righteous moral signaling from James Comey's Twitter account. He seems to get more into that recently about how... People shouldn't ever view the integrity of the FBI because there are a lot of great agents there. But these people, Strzok, who, who was texting, these people, or they even impugned the, impugned the integrity of the FBI by showing, acting so grossly partisan. So, and yeah, I, can't, I can't wait to see what we find from that, uh, whether you know the closed-door interviews that happen, the documents that Nunes is going to get out of this. But that's going to be a really interesting revelation, what we learn about those two who were also having an affair at the time that they were exchanging those messages and working on the Mueller probe. Right. And and I think we need to get answers. I agree with you. But we also have no evidence at this point that their personal political views impacted the investigation. We assume that, but we haven't seen evidence of that. So that will be one question that I think Congress will want to ask them. We also, I think, need some more answers. It would be helpful for the public to understand that the Mueller investigation is made up of hundreds of people. We just mentioned two. So when we talk about this rampant anti-Trump bias of the special counsel's office, I just don't think that that's actually so, true because a lot of these people, we have no idea what their political leanings are. And they actually don't have no idea what the way that, that I understand the it. Them we the way that I understand it is that this is a group of special people put together for the special prosecutor for a special look at this. And so would that mean a special treatment type of situation or a special bias? I think we have every right to ask that when you consider the political backgrounds of some of the people who've been brought on board as part of this special Team. And of there was two access out of, given out to of Comey's memos. Of people, though, of two, these are two people out of eight. No, 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 no. I'm talking team. a wider Grossly view. negligent of... was changed. It was removed. I mean, that's, that, that implies but, criminality. But, it was maybe that was, but I'm talking about likely. a wider view of people in their political backgrounds. And I realize right. everybody's, you know, it's a navel. You've got your own opinion. Everybody has one. And I get that. To. He was so right. important. It's demonstrating that uh, in the place of the job that, that is worrisome. And I think it is something well, that they will get to the bottom of. This is a person that you're somehow minimizing that was so important. I'm not minimizing it. That changed the language that the FBI director, James Comey, used in the exoneration. He was one and the, also it's sorry, the results Michael of the investigation. Flynn, he also he opened the Russian he investigation. He only one yeah, that he made also these decisions, worked guys. on Robert Mueller's team. He was I mean, not this, the this only person, person who, who made these so decisions. Many, yes, but you have to realize, not every person on an investigatory team carries the same weight. Sure. There are people at the top who can influence, especially when you have a very small group of people and they were who are investigating a something, part and that, that creates a vacuum. Imagine and if, if you don't know what's access. inside that vacuum, if you don't know what is exiting, that is very problematic, and we deserve answers to that and a lot more, because right now there are a lot of correlations to be made. Well, if not only for the other reason, too, Marie, it's about trust. I mean, you, you want to restore the public's trust of these agencies. It's important. But part of the reason the public doesn't trust them right now is there is a campaign to undermine the credibility of the Mueller investigation for partisan reasons. And I believe that. And I think we need to let I it I believe play that out. you believe that. We'll and talk. I believe a lot of other people do, too. <laughs> President Trump about to head to Camp David for top congressional Republicans meeting with them. They'll hash out the party's agenda for 2018 and talk a lot about, we would imagine, uh, how to hold on to power in November midterm elections. What the GOP must do to stay on top. You stay close. President Trump set to leave for Camp David just over an hour from now, where he'll be meeting with Republican congressional leaders. On the docket, hammering out a legislative agenda with a big focus on the president's infrastructure plan. They will also take a hard look at the political map for November. Historically, the president's party loses seats in midterm elections. 
Republicans obviously want to maintain control of Congress. House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy talking this morning about GOP sales pitch to the American people. We've had five special elections in the House this uh, last year. Republicans won all five of those. If you look at the Georgia race, too. Uh, but we know what history says. In the off-year election of a first new presidency, the party in power that has won the House, uh, that has won the White House, usually loses, on average, 25 seats in the, in the House. And 24 is our majority. So we have to go out, sell what we've actually been doing. The tax reform on economic growth, the more than 1.7 million new jobs created, the reform that we've been able to do in the VA, the entrepreneurship that we'll see coming through, and finish that that job infrastructure immigration health care take your but first you got to fund the government right so <laughs> when you talk about prioritizing there's a january 19th deadline right around the corner and i think they'll get i think they'll get the government funding through that rarely i mean the people who really cause the trouble on that are usually republicans at least in the modern era the democrats had a great history of doing that in the 80s and in the 70s not so much anymore uh but this may be Tax, tax reform may be the last Republican victory you really see on legislation because the party is divided on Donald Trump's agenda. They're, div they're divided on DACA. They're divided on trade protection. The Republicans generally agree on, on lower taxes, and Democrats aren't going to hand a single victory to the GOP in this midterm year. Why would they? Well, what we know, we, who we know is united, is Paul Ryan and the president both, they're pushing infrastructure. They want to go with that as the priority. But we'll see what comes out of the weekend, right? Well, at Camp David. Paul Ryan actually wants to go for entitlement cuts, which would be the smarter move if you weren't always so worried about job security and mm -hmm. being reelected, you know, because obviously in the House they're constantly running for re-election. And, you know, I've said it before, I'll say it again, they need to legislate like no one's voting. And they, they need to make better moves for the country, and that includes entitlement reform. That would be uh, the, the best move after passing the tax cuts, because if you go from tax cuts to spending this massive infrastructure plan, that will be economically very problematic. And I know it, it may have a short-term win, but I also don't think it's going to excite voters the way that uh, some of this other stuff could. So as you do look at somewhat of a divided GOP, mm -hmm. Marie, heading into this election year, midterms coming up, you know, is this an opportunity for Democrats? Absolutely. I mean, first of all, the historical trends help the party that's not in power. But then the specifics here I also think help Democrats. Chris is right, uh, if I had to guess. Tax reform is probably the last big thing the Republican Congress will get done, in part because Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan aren't on the same page. And they no. have very different caucuses in each of their, of their chambers. The Senate only has a one-vote Republican majority now. So I think that, you know, infrastructure is a complicated issue inside the Republican Party, let alone with mm. Democrats. The Immigration, fiscal hawks. Exactly, the fiscal hawks. You have people like Bob Corr and Jeff Flake who aren't running again who hate the deficit. But to be fair, this is happening this weekend. They're getting together top Republicans at Camp David, and this is the whole point. They're going to huddle, and they're going to decide <laughs> what is important. Uh, and, and to be fair, right it's after the first they, week of the year. Right after they stop talking about Steve Bannon in the book, I would imagine. Right. right? I mean, you know that's going to probably come yeah. up. Uh, so what Kennedy was talking about, though, was really interesting because Paul Ryan, remember we heard it floated, he might be leaving, exiting at a certain point. He can you know, kind of go with abandon on issues like entitlement if he's not going to come back. Uh, this, you know, if he's not going to run again. So that, that's interesting. Um, you've got others who may act that same way. So where do they fall down? Do they want to do entitlements? Do they, mm -hmm. what, what, what do they really want to get done? Because I don't agree. I think that Republicans do have some wins, maybe just one more. But they have to get on the same page. They're not even on the same page again about Obamacare. Right. I mean, want. did you read what the president is yeah. doing now? There's, there's so they're, no they're, way. They're, you know, proposing more no rules way. to take the teeth out of Obamacare. They're unraveling it. The president said when you wipe away the mandate, it's basically repealing it. They can't, you know, well, Mitch McConnell, Peter oh, Sutterman, we're not going to touch that. They can't even agree Peter on Sutterman that. Peter made a great point about that. Republicans all know they hate Obamacare. They don't know what they right. want to do to replace it. They well, we're they clear on that. Yeah, and, and they're not going to be able to mechanically do on health care what they did on tax reform. But they have to look at other areas where they actually can win and, and You know, the there. president can't do it all on his own. All right, we've got to leave it there. <laughs> Steve Bannon on the hot seat with key allies jumping ship in the wake of that controversial book. Whether he's lost his spot as leader of the conservative populist movement as the president once again weighs in. We will debate that one next.
Welcome back. An embattled Steve Bannon with allies abandoning him after his participation in a tell-all book about the Trump White House. The Washington Post reporting the Breitbart's owners are considering his ouster and conservative billionaire donor and big Bannon backer Rebecca Mercer issuing a sharp rebuke. She reportedly spoke to President Trump before she issued it. Mercer saying, quote, my family and I have not communicated with Steve Bannon in many months and have provided no financial support to his political agenda, nor do we support his recent actions and statements. And we have this from the president tweeting, the Mercer family recently dumped the leaker known as sloppy Steve Bannon, smart, as five GOP candidates backed by Bannon are now distancing themselves from him. And then there was this slap from White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders. Watch. One of the most important things that you can do uh, when you're working in any capacity, but especially in politics, is to be loyal. And I think we've seen a, a, a side that is, is frankly, uh, very, very disappointing um, and something that I hope we don't have to deal with again. All right, so Chris, I have to ask you, obviously, Roy Moore losing, that was Steve Bannon's cherry-picked candidate. Mm -hmm. That was uh, certainly a gut punch to him. But was cooperating with Michael Wolf in this new book, was that the death knell? So the Roy Moore thing was kind of silly on Steve Bannon because Roy Moore was probably going to win that primary anyways. Uh, Steve Bannon just attached himself to that name because he likes to attach himself to rabble-rousers. And Steve Bannon, I think one of his mistakes is he believed uh, the New York Times is press on how powerful he was. I don't think he was as powerful as he was given credit for. It's the same thing with like if Charles Koch believed the press on how he controls the GOP, <clears throat> he'd be crazy. Yeah. But he doesn't. So people were happy to attack Steve Bannon after the Alabama thing because he attached himself so closely. But this, anyone who's trying to influence the president knows you don't attack his daughter, you don't attack his son. He's, he's extremely personable about this. And Steve Bannon and Breitbart, they don't have a lot of advertisers because they go pretty hard out. So they're reliant on the Mercers to back them up with money. Yeah. And if that money dries up, they have to find a new billionaire or they're going to have to cut some salaries. So is he going to find a new billionaire? Is, is Steve Bannon still capable of reshaping his yeah. beauty and his image? You know, you kind of have to have some candidates if you're going to find a new a new billionaire, right? You have to have some people to spend money on. And people are walking away, guys like Michael Grimm. Uh, we're going to have him on in the next hour on overtime. You've got people walking away saying, no, I, I know I took some selfies with him before, but I'm not so sure that this is a person I want to attach myself to. So you have to have clients in order to attract that money, too, so that you can further the policy and the platform. I don't know. Maybe that's why he backtracked a little bit with the president saying, hey, great guy. We still believe in the policy. I asked yesterday, where is the lily pad for him? I I don't know that it will be inside the party. No, but the, the one thing about Steve Bannon and the fact that he is being ostracized, it seems to be good for the president because it allows congressional leaders to rally around the president where mm -hmm. Bannon was, was such a distancing force. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he had such a personal vendetta against Mitch McConnell. Yes. And now it, it sort of brings Mitch McConnell back into the fold and allows the president to kind of come off as a victim and also to uh, move forward with an economic agenda. And he, Steve Bannon has driven President Trump into more into the establishment. I think the question will be what happens in some of these Republican primaries this year leading up to 2018. In Nevada, Dean Heller is being primaried by a Bannon candidate uh, who now he's trying to walk away from Bannon. But Bannon has already unleashed uh, his, his message and his very hardline nationalist message. We will see if Republican voters, when there are primaries, stick with the establishment or stick with the Bannon candidates, even if Bannon's off the stage. Yeah. I think Bannon has already reshaped the GOP. Well, they'll call image. themselves something different. But we'll see. I don't think the establishment should celebrate the end of this uproarious populist movement because of Steve Bannon. Right. They may have they may have pushed him to the side, but a lot of voters still voted that way because they believe it. I agree with you. Yeah, because their I needs agree. have not been met by mm -hmm. the establishment. So what do Republicans do going forward? What did Josh Holmes say? The former aide to Mitch McConnell. Well, hey, let's, let's, let's find out. Let's Please. take a look at that. <laughs> hey, that's on the prompter. <laughs> that didn't work. He says that they're going to side with Trump. Let's put it that way. You know? He says uh, his only hook to Republican Party politics <laughs> was his relationship with the president. 
You saw how quickly everything's dissolved after the president's statement. Uh, Josh Holmes, obviously a big supporter of Mitch McConnell's, having been his chief of staff. Correct. Right. So he's so, doing aside with the president. I don't know. I don't want to sound cliche, but it's time, time will tell. I mean, that book is out this morning. We're going to learn a lot more, and a lot of time has to pass before we can really determine how that's going to look come. And Breitbart well, if he doesn't have cash, it's not going to take much time. But it doesn't but, take I mean, that much time. I mean, it depends on what we're talking about here. Breitbart has never had a massive following. I mean, they've had loyal followers. Yeah, but clearly but they can do he a has, lot without it. Clearly he had some. They, they did a lot. They were influential before he had direct access to the president. Yep, they exactly. got a lot of readers. But you see, actually, one of the more damaging...